Neil is a Renaissance man with multiple talents and interests, but his personality uh, is rounded. And behind that brilliance and behind that occasional gruffness uh, is a heart of gold. Today we're going to catch up with a distinguished and award-winning professor of neurosurgery who has spent his career on the front lines of medical technology. From his groundbreaking work with the Gamma Knife to today's innovative and non-invasive sound wave therapy. Join us as we catch up with Dr. Neil Cassell, founder and chairman of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. Come on. So tell us what inspired you to go into medicine. Ever since I had memories, all I wanted to do was neurosurgery. So I don't know if you call that an inspiration. It was almost something that was congenital. Ah, and now you, you left home at a pretty early age, right? Not how, early enough. But how, <laughs> how did you make it on your own to med school? <laughs> that I want to hear about. It, it, it was not a direct path. Yeah, so, so I want to hear about it. So, as I said, all I wanted to do was neurosurgery. And, and when I was in high school, it turned out that my former camp counselor was a medical student at Penn, and he was working in a neuro-ophthalmology slash neurosurgery laboratory in Camden, New Jersey. And he said, would you like to help out? for the summer and then the laboratory moved, I was 16 at the time, the laboratory moved from Camden to Philadelphia to Pennsylvania Hospital and I was the only one around to help move. So I was able to continue doing research during the high school year, but in addition I had the opportunity uh, to work in the hospital with this Dr. Langford who I was doing research with, Tom Langford, and I got to assist in the operating room. Oh my goodness. So. I, would, I was supposed to graduate from high school and they wouldn't let me graduate because I hadn't been in school enough doing research. Because in the you hospital. were in the operating room. Or in the, in the <laughs> laboratory and I, you know, I didn't go to school enough. Fortunately, I had a letter of acceptance from Penn because they didn't understand that I wasn't graduating from high school. So. <laughs> that worked out. So then I had that spring semester off, worked in the laboratory of the spring and summer, and then I went to uh, Penn for four years and three summers. I had a little trouble in college. <laughs> so I wanted to go to medical school, and I remember I, I interviewed at, uh, at Penn with the Dean of Admissions, and he said, if you want to go to uh, medical school, you have to go back and start college all over. Long and short of it is uh, they accepted me to Penn Medical School in large part because I published a lot of papers, but also because I had three letters from directors of neurosurgery residency programs that said in the unlikely event that I was ever able to get through medical school, that they would take me into the residency. That's an interesting path. So I didn't graduate high school, I didn't gra graduate college. It's not a path I would recommend to anybody who wants to pursue a career in medicine today. And now you're an, you are internationally respected in your field as a brain surgeon and that's, okay, that's fascinating. Now let's fast forward to UVA. So talk about your experience at UVA. You were co-chair of your department for 10 years. Well, and practicing so, surgeon? Yeah, so after my residency, I was recruited to the University of Iowa. It was Actually, I was sort of banished to the great interior for seven years. And then in April of 1983, I was at a neurosurgery meeting in Washington. And I remember John Jane was walking down the hall with Becky Rimel, who's the CEO of the Pew Foundation, and they came up to me and said, what would you think about moving to Charlottesville? And I said, I accept. Because I appreciated, a f I brought the program that I'd created in Iowa to Virginia, we'd have the best program in the world. He saved my life. He clipped the main aneurysm, and how they do that is to open up your skull and expose the brain, and then they go in and, and clip it. 
and then they put the skull back together and sew your head up and out you go. So what does it take to be a brain surgeon? First of all, you have to be a male. Okay, later, okay, okay. No, that was bad. <laughs> it was, but we got in a lot of trouble because over, <laughs> o over the years, we'd never had a female resident or a female faculty member. And I, <laughs> and we took a lot of heat for that. Uh -huh. But it's changed now. Uh -huh. I guess the world's changed. Okay, <laughs> any other thoughts about what it takes to be a brain surgeon? I mean, well, you, what does it feel like to save a life? Most of us will never <laughs> know. What does that feel like? Well, I can't tell you that. I can tell you what it feels like to lose a life. Oh, yeah. So, to, to do the type of neurosurgery that I did is a uh, privilege that is beyond words. But more than that, it's a responsibility which most people can't imagine. So anyhow, you have to you know, work incredibly long hours, get no sleep, and uh, be emotionally deranged. <laughs> right. So that, that leads to my next question. What is it like working with you? you do you have sort of a reputation, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Are you tough or are you easy? I, I think I'm, I'm extremely tough, but I'm not as tough on uh, the people who work for me as I am on myself. Oh, yeah. So, and now, so you're not practicing surgery anymore, but you have a brand new, really super exciting, I don't want to say project, it's... It is a project. And I'm, uh, you know, I'm not practicing surgery anymore, but I can tell you, I practice surgery in my dreams two or three nights a week. I bet you do. Yeah. I, that doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah. So, but talk about this. This is, this is focused ultrasound. Focused ultrasound is an early stage, sort of still in the development stage, non-invasive therapeutic technology that could be, could, if it's, when it's fully developed, be a replacement or an alternative to much of surgery, to radiation therapy, and a new way to deliver drugs precisely to the point where it's needed in the body. And it has the potential to improve the lives of, without exaggeration, millions of people with serious medical disorders around the world. And there, you do have some pretty amazing results right now, I mean, with tremors. With, explain that. So, focused ultrasound has been used for a, a number of indications. Although it's early stage, it's very much real today. Mm -hmm. And one of the indications where it's gone through clinical trials is a, is a central tremor, which is a benign tremor, which affects a large numbers of the population. And it's, it's pretty impressive because some of these patients have been disabled for 10 or 15 or 20 years by their right, shaking. You can't even, you can't, you can't hold a spoon, you can't eat soup. Right, and they go into the focused ultrasound machine for a couple of hours and they come out and they're cured. This is a home video of a young woman who's essentially disabled by the abnormal movements of Parkinson's disease. What could focused ultrasound do for this woman? That video was me just 10 weeks ago. Look at me now. So you're the founder and the chairman of the Focused Ultrasound Foundation. What are you working on and, and what do you want to see happen? The problem is that a new therapeutic device takes decades to evolve from being an idea into to being a widespread standard of care. And we created this foundation simply to shorten the time it takes from laboratory research until widespread patient treatment because we get calls and emails and letters from huge numbers of patients who have disorders that we know 
be treated with focused ultrasound two or three or four or five years from now, but we're not there yet. Oh, yeah. So the frustration, is, the, the level of frustration that we feel is, is pretty significant. So the, the ratio of uh, pleasure to frustration has shifted into the frustration. And, and knowing that in, a, in many of the instances, the, uh, what these new treatments that are on the horizon, not over the horizon, the distance can be shortened by the brute force application of money. But you don't seem to have been stopped by frustration before. No. No. <laughs> you no. Know, when you talk about your, your medical career, and then you refer to your evil eye. You know, you're a surgeon with a, what you call it an evil eye. What does that mean? It means that um, I'm defective. I was born blind in, almost blind in my left eye. And that hasn't stopped you at all, did it? Did someone ever say, well, you can't do this because... Yeah, when I, I wanted to go to do the last half of my residency with Dr. Drake in London, Ontario, who at the time was the leading neurosurgeon in the world. And he said, oh. I, I can't take you as a resident because you don't have depth perception. I said, and I persisted. And he said, okay, I'll take you as for one year and if it works out, then you can have the second year. And he took me and then it was funny because he said that uh, the reason that I was uh, exceptionally talented in the operating room working through the microscope was because I didn't have trouble adopting to the binocular vision through the binocular microscope. Bingo. Yeah, so. Oh, bingo, so you made it work. So, so where do you see yourself in 10 years? I, I hope that I am as uh, excited and uh, active as I am now. And I feel like I'm 45 because you're old, only as old as the woman you feel. And my wife is 45. <laughs> And you've raised three daughters all by yourself, right? I did from the time they were five, seven, and nine. I'm not sure I raised them. They, they grew up with me as a single parent. But they turned out okay. They're doing well and they like you. They, they're, they're doing extremely well. I think like me may be an exaggeration <laughs> or a misrepresentation. Oh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Okay. Thank you.